Um, I'm Laura Breeden. I'm the chair of the board of NDIA, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this beautiful space in the Cleveland Public Library. Um, they have been an amazing partner to us in putting this conference together, provided lots of on the ground, behind the scenes support. They offered us space yesterday for our pre-conference workshops, and I'm very proud that today the library director is going to um, welcome us personally to the public library. He is quite an amazing leader, and like a lot of you, and like me, he fell in love with libraries at a young age. If you want to know the whole story, I, I would refer you to a wonderful TEDx talk that you can find online, um, where he talks about um, how he came to love libraries, his library career, and the amazing vision that he has for the Cleveland Public Library. So without any further ado, I'd like for you to welcome Felton Thomas to the podium. Thank you, Laura, and uh, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Thomas, I'm the director here at the Clean Public Library. And, uh, you know, I just want to first take the time to thank NDIA, Angela, Laura, all of those folks who chose Cleveland and for coming, and, and for coming here and all of you. Uh, we very much appreciate seeing you here in Cleveland. I want to take the time to thank my staff. Please give them a round of applause. They've done a fantastic job here. And then I want to welcome you to Cleveland. We have a very stormy relationship with Mother Nature. So I apologize for the fact that uh, it's been a little cold over the past couple of days. But it is warming up and the sun is coming out. So I hope you have a chance to get out, go and view some of our great museums throughout the city, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Museum of Art, the Symphony, and of course, the Cleveland Public Library. This is a wonderful space. It's two buildings, this building, you have the garden, and then right next door to us, you have our main library built in 1925 that has unbelievable architecture and actually has our collection of the largest collection of materials on chess in the world. So if you're interested in that, you can go over. Um, right now, we've been having contests among our elementary age kids, um, and there will be a, a uh, a contest tomorrow between our high school kids. And so we are always uh, challenging our young people with our collections. So I I'm here to just, just make a few remarks. And one of the things that I, I, it always kind of challenges me is when I drive home from an event late night, 10, 11 o'clock at night, and I drive by one of our libraries, and I see young people outside of the libraries, either with their phones or with their laptops sitting out there, working on homework at 11 o'clock at night, midnight, you know, because the library is the only place they have access. Um, and so we know that we're not alone in this work. Um, and so I wanted to thank our partners, the uh, Cleveland Foundation, their partners here in Cleveland, we three, our computer refurbishing uh, group, CMHA, Digital C, Ashbury Senior Community Center, uh, Bill Callahan, where are you here? Nobody's pushing that more than, than, than Bill. Bill is like tireless in his work for that. <laughs> you can't be tired yet. We still got a long way to go. But even with strong collaborative partnerships like these, uh, we know that there are not enough for net inclusion to become a reality. We know that we must also forge alliances with advocates and policymakers who can help change the landscape in favor of inclusion and access for all. So we're thrilled to host this conference with all of you, like-minded individuals and organizations. Together we will find and forge solutions that work. So I, without further ado, I wanna thank you for visiting Cleveland. We hope to see you around. If you have a chance and you get a few minutes before you go up to the reception, go across the hall into our tech center where our makerspace is, that's my plug. It's my ad. But right now, I'd like to welcome two spe special guests, Mariah Smith from Harvard's Berkman Client Center for Internet and Society, and Karen Heredia from the New Media Advocacy Project. 
Uh, Maria and Karen are going to introduce Dividing Lines, a new video highlighting the impact of internet access disparities in American communities. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be back in Cleveland for the second time now this spring, if we can call it spring. Um, thank you to NDIA, thank you to its partners, and thank you to the Cleveland Public Library um, for hosting this really important conference. I've traveled here from Boston where I work on, alongside researchers, academics, lawyers, and students at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society and I support the work of Professor Susan Crawford, who I'm delighted to say is our keynote speaker um, this afternoon. And I began working with and learning from Professor Crawford when I was still an undergraduate, and she is a true leader and visionary in this space and has inspired my career in many ways. I grew up outside of Kansas City on the Missouri side where Google Fiber launched its gigabit fiber network in 2012. It was a set of maps, however, that seemed to me to undermine the validity of Google's mission to connect everyone. Green dots indicated fiber investments, and red dots indicated the neighborhoods that Google didn't plan to invest in infrastructure, and also the neighborhoods with the lowest connectivity rates. The dots divided the city along the dividing line of Kansas City, which has been the dividing li line for decades, Troost Avenue. So there's green on one side and red on the other side. We have a crisis on our hands, and outside the circles and the networks of the circles represented in this room, people are not outraged about it. Over the past year, I've set out to connect human faces, human narratives, to these deeply layered issues of internet access. And I've been working with Karen Heredia at New Media Advocacy Project to make this film come to life. So I'll turn it over for a moment to Karen, and then get back up. Hi everyone, my name is Karen Heredia and I'm a filmmaker and project manager at New Media Advocacy Project, uh, or NMAP for short. NMAP is a human rights and media organization. We're based in New York, but we work domestically and internationally. And we are at the intersection between law and multimedia storytelling. So in all of our projects, we work closely with partner organizations to help them develop and implement media advocacy strategies that will um, address specific challenges that they're having in their work or achieve specific advocacy goals. Um, our work and the videos we've produced have helped our partners win legal cases and advocacy campaigns, mobilize communities, and influence policy. Um, it's been a pleasure working with Mariah and the Berkman Klein Center um, when I think from the very beginning we knew we wanted to create a flexible set of media that would um, you know, be useful for advocates on all fronts, whether it's working with voters or communities on the ground and via social media, or at events and conferences and meetings with legislators and representatives. Um, we also knew that we really wanted to bring the personal experiences of people who are working with and facing uh, the digital divides in this country, and we really wanted to bring those to life um, since often media about internet infrastructure can be a little bit technical. Um, and so we wanted to portray, um, to capture human stories. Um, so I hope, you, I hope you enjoy the video. Um, I just want to thank Mariah and Professor Crawford and the Berkman Klein Center and NDIA for having us, the Cleveland Public Library as well. And I especially want to thank the people, um, some of you who are in this room, who helped us find the stories and who shared your stories. Um, I hope you enjoy. Back to mine. So just to kind of piggyback off of what Karen was saying, we really want to enlist all of you, the first audience for this video, to help us devise ways that it can be most useful in your ongoing work and in your advocacy work. As you watch, please consider opportunities for future screenings and other ways that you can embed the Dividing Line series, which is this video and three other pieces of media. So we have a trailer that kind of, for a minute and a half, gets into the issues quickly that this video represents, and we have two shorter advocacy pieces about 
um, the rural infrastructure divide. And those three videos are on dividinglines.org. And please reach out to me through the contact form there if you'd like to deploy them in specific ways, and I will work with you to do that. Um, without further ado, seems to be the topic sentence here, it's a great privilege to premiere this film with all of you, the true leaders in this space, redefining what should be basic for everyone, equitable, affordable access to the connective tissue of our time. So thank you, thank you. is everywhere. It's a requirement of our life now. I'm a sophomore in high school. I have 11 classes. Most of the time I have to do between three to four essays or two projects every night. My teacher requires everything to be an online. Every year my work is required online more and more worksheets at Google Classroom, Google Drive, and Google Docs that I have to turn in. But it's kind of hard now because I currently don't have internet access at home and my parents don't have enough money to pay for it. We just have one company around this area and it's really expensive. So I try my best to get internet in other ways. I have to say after school, go to a library, a public library, to do my essays. So it's really hard for me to do my work because I have to look for a computer, wait for it, and then there's a time limit because there's a lot of people going over there to use a computer to do their work. I want to go to college. I want to be a surgeon to treat people with cancer. I'm going to be the first person in the family who goes to college. Most of my friends don't have internet at home because they can't afford it either. It's really funny for me and my friends because we see tech companies all around us in San Francisco and then we can't afford internet. We will all be better students if we had internet at home. Mi esposo y yo trabajamos tiempo completo. Tengo el bill de la renta, el teléfono, gas, puente. Son tantas cosas que hay que ver antes. Lastimosamente hasta el día de hoy no hemos podido tenerlo. Eh, en esta área solo tengo, tenemos una opción de compra de internet. Es una necesidad más básica en el hogar. Antes lo miraba uno como lujo, ahora ya no. La educación se basa en la tecnología, en el internet. Y esa es la razón por que las compañías se, se aprovechan de nosotros, pues porque saben que necesitamos internet en casa por nuestros hijos. El no tener internet le daría de ventaja bastante en la escuela a mi hija. Ella ya está preparándose para lo que es la universidad. Aplicaciones no las podemos hacer porque es por internet. About 60 million people who live in the United States do not have high-speed internet at home. The majority of those people cite expense as the reason for why they don't have internet at home. Those people who are without internet access at home are predominantly disabled, minorities, under-resourced, underprivileged. They're the people who are just being left behind in all other aspects of their lives here in the United States. And as most people know, if you don't have internet in America, you will be left behind. Having access to a smartphone is not enough. It's very difficult to apply for jobs for children to do their homework. Most of us take internet access for granted. And to be quite frank with you, I believe everyone in our society should be in a position to take it for granted. Because it is so fundamental to our daily lives. The fact that we have over 800,000 San Francisco residents consider ourselves to be the technology capital of the world and the fact that we still have over 100,000 San Francisco residents without internet access at home to me is criminal.
Internet service providers are pretty much in a very comfortable space. Mergers have created opportunities for companies to not really need to get all these customers online, so there's not a requirement to actually go after underprivileged people who can't afford this. The old version of separate but equal here is, well, people can always go to the library, and that's true. People can go to the library, and now people can get a limited amount of data to the extent they can afford it, which is not the same thing as you and me going home and getting on our laptop. And it certainly isn't the same thing from our kids' point of view in terms of school or our point of view when we're looking for a job. barrier to kind of routine internet access and use is simply affordability. It's one of the reasons why this computer center and a number of others around the city, we have been paying such close attention to the affordable alternatives that people have or are supposed to have. AT&T's so-called access program is offering service at the best speed you could get up to 10 megs for five to ten dollars. This was something that he negotiated with the FCC as a concession in connection with their DirecTV acquisition two years ago. This was the old FCC where, you know, where the FCC actually used to say, you need to do something for poor people as part of this deal to make a billion dollars. So this was AT&T's concession. If we were going to advertise this service, we certainly didn't want to be advertising in the neighborhoods where it was not available. So we did a thorough mapping of all of the federal data that was available, and the map basically showed that there was about 60,000 households which didn't have 3 meg service. You may say, what, 3 meg down? Who doesn't have that, right? Well, the answer is about a fifth of the city. I'm a retiree. I worked for Ohio Bell, a telephone company, for 32 years. They said fiber internet is coming about eight years ago. AT&T promised me that. And everybody was, oh, we were so excited about broadband and how oh, we're going to get it. And I got it. It didn't work right. I have to wait and wait and wait. I do my banking on there, and it's so slow. I go and record something, but it won't play back immediately, which it should. Sometimes I have to wait up to between eight and 10 hours. They never told me initially, no matter what equipment I had, it wasn't going to work because we didn't have broadband in this area. So I'm paying for a service that I'm not getting, that I was promised. They have a program where you don't have to go to Cleveland Clinic to see a doctor. You can talk to your doctor on your tablet, your computer, whatever. I have the insurance. I have the equipment to see the doctor on, but I have no means to get to him. Because of the internet speed, I'm being denied a very good service. And it was finally this realization like, oh, I wonder if at and is just not investing in those neighborhoods. And yes, that's exactly what's happening. They're just not investing in these poorer neighborhoods. You can get very slow internet from at and or you can get really expensive, really fast, great internet from Spectrum. Is that really the kind of choice that's reasonable? No, it's because we don't have competition. Well, once we saw that, then it was easy enough to trace back what had happened. So in 2007, the state legislature had eliminated state regulation. And they did it supposedly so AT&T would go out and build competitive cable systems. AT&T had gone and done exactly what you would have expected. They built their new system called Uverse in places where they thought they could make more money and didn't build it in other places. It was a pretty important policy consequence of the state that nobody knew had happened. Since then, we've done the same research on several other cities. There's a very similar pattern in Detroit, very similar pattern in Dayton, very similar pattern in Toledo. AT&T has discriminated in the deployment of its service to low-income African-American neighborhoods of Cleveland and Detroit, and the FCC has the power to call into account on it. The FCC can stop them from doing it, but now they're not going to. AT&T 
Green Tea will not give us poor people the top of the line internet. They don't want to be bothered with us. I don't want to move out of Cleveland. I want to stay right here. I shouldn't have to move not to be discriminated against. I'm losing a lot of things that I could have because of it. And it, it really interrupts your quality of life, the quality of retirement. The internet has become the platform on which the world works. In Oregon, fortunately, that was identified as something that we should be talking about by the state's leaders. Oregon has been engaged in public policy planning around telecommunications as a strategic issue for the state for over 25 years. Well, Oregon is a big western state with a relatively small population, yet we are in a fairly, fairly strong position regarding broadband availability, adoption, and utilization. La Grande is nestled in the middle of the Blue Mountains and it's an amazing, wonderful place to live. With us being in such a rural community, not having the neonatal unit for infants makes it harder, so you have to get flown out. You usually end up having to go to Portland or to Boise to lower the risk of complications. When our daughter Maya was born, things got really scary. My doctor um, told me there's problems, she's not breathing, but we're working on her. They started um, resuscitating her and doing CPR right away while I was laying there. It was absolutely terrifying and a mother's worst nightmare. Maya was born with high drops. She was born with fluid in the chest cavity, and the survival rate for high drops is slim. On average, only 10% usually survive. But we needed help to know what our next steps would be and to know how we were gonna treat this because this is something that we don't, we don't see in a rural hospital often. Uh, but having telemedicine here and having our robot allowed us to have a neonatal intensive care physician at our shoulder helping us all along the way. They did a phenomenal job keeping her breathing, keeping her alive. The telemedicine uh, program is a godsend. High-speed uh, internet is uh, necessary for everything, like telemedicine. You, you don't want a blurry picture for the consulting physician. You are talking about a tiny baby's life here. So definitely high-speed uh, internet is, uh, is a must. There was fiber run through our region several years ago. I don't believe we've been able to establish our telemedicine program without fiber running through our community. Just because you live in a rural community doesn't mean you shouldn't have access to urban medicine. And with our broadband connectivity and our state-of-the-art telemedicine devices, we can offer that to anyone. Our hope in Cleveland is not that we will somehow get AT&T to behave differently. They're not going to do it. They've made really clear they're not going to do it. If we believe that everyone should have access to high-speed internet in this country, then the government has to get involved where companies are not doing their part. To our leaders at the FCC, the internet is essential for everybody. This is a fight worth fighting. There's no time to wait. We are effectively leaving generations behind in our society. But I think most of this is happening without people realizing. Now most people have busy daily lives, everyone does. We're raising children, we have multiple jobs, we're, we're doing everything we can, but unless we engage, unless we vote, unless we engage on the issues, quite frankly, it's all of us to blame. And people are railroading us into the future that we do not want. I feel betrayed because of this internet. 
I need an internet at home to finish high school, to go to college. I really wish somebody could fix this because right now I only have two more years of high school and I can't wait for it. job is to say how terrific Mariah Smith is for making that movie. So one more time, folks, please. I, I just couldn't be happier. And I do hope it's a very useful tool for all of you in whatever endeavor you're engaged in. So I'm Susan Crawford. I know Mariah Smith. And uh, I have no clients, no consulting arrangements, and I'm also not affiliated with the Berkman Klein Center. I'm here because something is profoundly wrong with the way we live in America. Profoundly wrong. It's structurally wrong in a host of interconnected ways. Today, after 30 years of attacks on the basic idea that government should have anything to do with the private marketplace, 30 years of attacks on the idea that government intervention is even appropriate, we're in a horrible situation, and all of you know that. I'm going to talk today about internet access. That's been our theme, and this is the theme of the conference. And it's an important symptom of this horrible situation, but I want you to keep this very large picture in mind. Because of our current unquestioning belief in the primacy of individual profit-taking as the only value that matters, we are living now, right now, through a period of grotesque inequality in America. It is overwhelming to consider the vicious outgrowth of inequality. Bad health, missed educational opportunity, increasingly everything coming from depression and stress. Alcoholism, obesity, gambling, criminality, rage, fear, lack of trust, a feeling of corrosive unfairness. I'm worried about the violence and the turn towards authoritarianism that is ahead. Democracy and capitalism just can't survive if its workings are reduced to just giving the wealthy another chance to become wealthier. Because inequality is not a technical issue. Inequality causes and exacerbates a steep loss in social cohesion. Higher wealth people begin to feel as if they're living in a series of gated communities whose main purpose is to keep out less fortunate people. And less fortunate people deeply internalize this feeling of hopelessness and despair. This loss of a sense of community, of brotherhood, triggers extreme uncertainty. That in a barbaric circle triggers fear, lack of trust in civic institutions at the same time that those civic institutions are systematically undermined, underfunded, and hollowed out. Our failure to make sure that respectable internet access service, fiber to every home and business in America, at a reasonable price is available to everyone, it's not even available to rich people in America, is just one part of a terrifying landscape. We are suffering deeply from an eviscerated public sector and an increasing lack of trust, not just in the last year, over the last 30 years. And all of this is connected. We don't quite see how bad it is, we're like, an ant on a tablecloth. We're like the people right before 1914. Our parents and grandparents understood how important it is for governments to moderate the chaos and despair that results from the ravages of unrestrained money making and profit taking. We've forgotten so much. After the two world wars and the Great Depression that followed 1914, Americans and the citizens of every other developed country absolutely understood that it simply is not true that unrestrained private gain 
always leads to public good. You would have been laughed off a stage in the early 1950s if you'd said that, and we had a Republican president in power at the time. Today, even mentioning the words economic policy, industrial policy, oversight, or regulation triggers the word socialist, and I can't tell you how ridiculous that is. I'm not talking about government telling us what is good for us. I'm talking about the private sector being required through oversights and industrial policy to provide world-class baseline infrastructure, fiber, reaching home, homes and businesses throughout the country. The public sector has the responsibility to require the private sector to do this. Alone among developed countries, we've always relied on private companies to provide us with telecommunications. And now the public sector has to step up. This is just like Eisenhower in 1952, requiring uh, highway infrastructure to stretch across the land. This is about ensuring that everyone, every American, rich and poor, has access to services and resources that are essential to a thriving, decent life. One of those things that is necessary today, and you all know this, is basic, I'm going to up the ante, basic but world-class, persistent, uncapped internet access for everyone at a reasonable rate, somewhere between $25 and $40 a month, with subsidies for the very lowest income Americans. Fixing this situation by having the courage to have a public sector industrial policy strategy when it comes to telecommunications infrastructure this isn't by itself going to fix America. I know that. We've got tons of other problems. People need affordable housing, adequate public transit, de decent baseline public education, a way to be protected from the ravages of climate change. I get it. We need all of that. But getting internet access right may not be sufficient, but it is necessary. It's necessary. It's central. Information is central to absolutely everything we do and every policy we care about as a nation. Reducing communications inequality and upgrading the entire country is justified not only from a social justice perspective, but from a cost-benefit perspective as well. We are writing enormous invisible checks every day, running enormous digital de deficits as a country because we have failed on this central issue. And again, we are ceasing to be a we. We're driving ever larger wedges between rural and urban Americans and between white and non-white Americans with our communications failures. That's the greatest ultimate risk of all. We should be shocked. Today in America, the land where the internet protocol was invented, in America, the land of grit, innovation, new ideas, and thriving life, we should be looking the rest of the world in the rearview mirror when it comes to high capacity, cheap internet access. But we're not. Rich people in cities are paying through the nose for second-rate service with not fiber. Poor people and people in rural areas are struggling to pay for third-rate services where it is available at all. And as Mark uh, Farrell, the mayor of San Francisco, said in the video, we're dumbing down generations of new Americans. It's just like leaded water in Flint. Life for many people has once again become solitary, poor, and more than a little nasty. Although it is so fundamental to a thriving life to have choices, respect, and agency, without high-speed internet access, your choices are few and desperately local. We have taken away opportunities from millions of Americans. As you know, this is not about connectivity in the abstract or as a technical matter. The only point of connectivity is what you can do with it. It's about freedom to choose your own activities, always on, no data caps. And it's not just about inclusion but also the ability to participate and thrive. The well-being of millions, of really 330 million Americans and all of their businesses is being harmed. If you remember one thing from this talk, I hope it's this. This appalling state of affairs didn't happen naturally. It happened because of failures of policy that can be fixed. Right now, the policy of the nation is to allow the giant carriers to back up their trucks to the loading docks of the FCC and take as much money as they can drive away with, while extracting unbelievable rents from every part of society, not just the very poor, but also the rich and also the business sector. It's an extractive industry. As a country, we are capable of making different choices. Here's the reason for all this. There are some essential things that we used to understand that the private sector, an unfettered free market left to its own devices, is never going to provide to all Americans, even though everyone needs them. High capacity, ubiquitous, cheap internet access is one of them. 
Listen, a, a sensible profit-making company in the communications infrastructure business, which has very high fixed initial costs to build those networks, will make the most profit where it can by charging rich people enormous amounts, avoid competition wherever it can by consolidating and dividing markets. You take Cleveland, I'll take Minneapolis, and leave everyone that doesn't fit its business model or can't afford its charges out. And never, ever upgrading their crappy existing services to fiber. That's a root story in America, and particularly uh, in the Cleveland story. Fiber to the node even isn't enough. Everyone that doesn't fit the business model includes a, a lot of people. Most people with yearly incomes under $25,000 a year don't have high-speed internet access at home. That's what's happened in America. There is nothing evil or malign about these companies. There are five of them. They dominate internet access in America. Comcast, Spectrum, AT&T, Verizon, and CenturyLink. But their unrestrained incentives are not aligned with what Americans need. Electricity, by the way, has exactly these same characteristics. And 100 years ago, it took Franklin Roosevelt fighting private electrical company trusts to ensure that everyone everywhere got cheap power. People may have forgotten the story, but in cities in America, people in poorer neighborhoods did not get electricity as quickly as the richer folks did. And rural areas certainly didn't get electricity. And this should all sound very familiar for people who work on internet access issues. The tools that Roosevelt used to get us to decency were government oversight, regulation, in some cases outright government operation, as in the Tennessee Valley Authority. We are today replicating all the patterns we went through with electricity when it comes to internet access. And we'll need a presidential candidate in 2020 who understands this issue and can take leadership a digital FDR. It is amazing, but electricity was the primary uh, domestic policy issue in the election of 1932 because it was such a searing problem for the country. In a democracy, there is a difference between private incentives, which are to optimize profits, nothing wrong with that, and public value, and the public values of fa fairness, universality, and justice. And our public sector needs to be bolstered and able to stand up for itself so that the private sector can do its job well and everyone can thrive. Otherwise, why choose America? You know, in China, there is no line between the public and private, right? The searing unfairness of digital services in both urban and rural areas of this company is happening in a broad context. We're suffering from a digital divide as a country. On the global stage, there's a deep and widening divide between the US on the one hand and Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, and China on the other, where fiber optic lines now reach or soon will reach all residents, and where new ways of making a living, new businesses, new ways of ensuring the thriving lives of citizens are likely to emerge first. We all also, as you know, suffering from gaping digital divides between richer and poorer Americans that will make our existing already shocking inequality worse and even further weaken the fabric of democracy. So here are the facts which underline the wonderful video that Mariah has made. Local cable and tel telco monopolies dominate access. They have no particular incentives to improve their services or charge what people can actually afford for them. They are unconstrained, untroubled, unruffled by either competition or oversight most of the time. And for services providing the capacity that the FCC now labels high-speed internet access, 25 megabytes down, megabits down, three up, something like 90% of Americans have at most one choice of provider who can set whatever prices they want. Why the FCC privileges downloads or uploads is confounding to me. This is part of participating, not just being entertained. About a quarter of Americans, or almost 74 million people, live in areas where less than 40% of residents subscribe to even awful copper line access. People in rural areas are 10 times more likely to have, less likely to have access to modern day high capacity connections than those in urban areas. Rural areas are even less likely to have choices of providers. And where access is present, low adoption is tightly correlated with low socioeconomic status. About 60% of people making 20,000 or less a year don't have wired access, even awful last century copper, copper wired access at home. But 80% of people making between $50,000 and $75,000 a year do. Price makes a big difference, as the video made clear. We don't compare well internationally either. When it comes to the highest speed uh, packages here in America, we pay more 
we pay more than just a handful of developed countries, Mexico, Chile, Brazil, Turkey. Um, and in these other places, South Korea, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Sweden, I keep going there to try to find out what they did to make the situation so different. They have many more choices of carriers, far lower prices, far higher capacity. In South Korea, Japan, Singapore, and Hong Kong, residents can subscribe to gigabit capacity, 10 times more capacity than 100 megabit subscription, for between $30 and $50 a month. In Sweden, which has announced plans to have 98% of its residents connected to gigabit fiber by 2025, the 100 megabit symmetrical fiber connections already available to 70% of residents cost between $35 and $40 a month to access. Singapore's connectivity story is just astonishing. You can buy gigabit access from any one of many providers for 40 bucks a month. Even in New York, you can't buy that access, and uh, you can buy something that's a tenth as good for uh, more money, $105 a month for 100 megabit per second access from Verizon. Yes, these places are smaller. Yes, they're more homogenous than the US, but somehow we manage the telephone. Somehow we manage electricity, and it is embarrassing to have a Korean tell me that coming to America is like taking a rural vacation <laughs> because life is so slow here. It is embarrassing for the Stockholm mayor the mayor of Stockholm said to me, what can I do to help America? <laughs> you know, this is America. We're supposed to be exceptional. Well, I'm here to remind us that we are not in this instance. We keep repeating patterns. In the 1930s, government surveyors looked at neighborhoods in America and decided, outlined some in red that they felt were hazardous for mortgage credit risks because of residents' racial and ethnic demographics. Basically, anybody who wasn't Northern European white was considered to be a problem for the value of the area. Bill Callahan makes this clear in the video. This con these continue to be areas of stubborn poverty, these redlined areas, where loans were very expensive to obtain or simply unavailable. Low-income minorities couldn't buy homes, and persistent, searing racial wealth gaps have been maintained in this country. As you know well, those same redlined areas remain places where these perfectly rational, not mean, not malign private companies are not going. It's not that they physically can't, it's that they don't have to, and their shareholders aren't interested. By contrast, when a new immigrant area opens in Stockholm, they run train lines and fiber out there immediately. That's the first step. We're not Sweden, we're never gonna be Sweden, but the sensible nature of the Stockholm plan is where I wanna end this brief talk. Swedes don't want the government to sell private internet access, they love the private sector. What they do, what they did 20 years ago, is put just passive infrastructure, like a street grid, neutral conduit or glass for fiber optic, wholesale services, then that's leased at set prices to private sector competitors. Presto, a competitive market for world-class internet access, and that's where San Francisco is heading right now because of Mayor Farrell. Because it turns out that capitalism needs government structures to thrive. That's the regulatory ideal. Government intervention, particularly when it comes to basic infrastructure, like a functioning communication system or a street grid, facilitates genuinely free markets and a thriving populace by ensuring that basic inputs are in place that are fair and public-minded. But without government involvement, you'll never get to that place. The reason we're doing so badly in the United States is that in 2004, we uh, deregulated the entire internet service uh, marketplace. We swerved away from government oversight of internet access providers. We assumed that competition would protect consumers and somehow magically ensure access for all. That hasn't happened. It was actually predictable that that wouldn't happen. We just seem to need to learn the same lesson over and over again. In order to change anything large, you need two things. You need both crisis and leadership. We certainly have a crisis. Now it's time to see whether leadership emerges, and I'm most help, hopeful of people in Mariah's generation uh, to be leaders, but it, it has to happen faster so that girl can finish high school with a great internet access connection. We need leadership to emerge that will take strong economic policy action to get that basic fiber infrastructure installed to homes and businesses across the country. I'm not saying fixing this situation is sufficient to stave off our further collapse. I am saying fixing it is necessary. It's like electricity. It's essential for the fabric of our democracy to hold. Thank you very much.
totally up to you. Yeah. Uh -oh. Just come and have a seat. Elizabeth is always the problem child. <laughs> <More. laughs> Well, that was awesome. That was amazing. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Big thank you for oh, joining so us welcome. today. So our panel today is Elizabeth Lindsay from Bite Back, Bobby Coulter from Fresno Housing Authority, and of course, you already met Susan. Um, so what we want to, and I'm Angela Seifer uh, from NDIA. We want to talk about considering the lack of uh, national uh, support and federal support, what's happening at the local level? How are folks responding with the situation that we have? We know that we need more than connectivity and we know that we need the digital literacy skills and we need, um, well the connectivity needs to be affordable uh, and it needs to be present. And then we also need tech support and we need the right devices. So what's happening at the local level? Those solutions are not coming from the feds, right? Those solutions are happening in our communities. So Elizabeth, can we start with you a little bit about a sure. quick, quick introduction of Bite Back and then kind of how you're addressing this. Absolutely, I've been speaking a lot today so I'm sure all of you can repeat what I'm about to say by memory, but um, I am Elizabeth Lindsay. I'm the executive director of Bite Back. We're a DC-based nonprofit and we provide digital literacy training as well as career services to unemployed and underemployed adults. We help them move into living wage careers that use technology and we're unique in that we start folks, uh, we work with folks who have low or no tech skills. So we start from the very beginner level and help, pe pe help people move up into more advanced skills. And um, do you want me to talk about our partnerships or? Yeah, that, the idea that um, we need all of these things and how is, the, so for example, for you all, the local city government is actually a partner is helpful. How, how do they interact with you? That doesn't happen in all cities. Sure. So it's exciting that it happens in D.C. Absolutely. So um, you are totally right, Angela. We need all of these things. And I think it, the people in this room know this more than probably anyone in the country, that um, just having access is not enough. Just having uh, a device is not enough. We also need training. And we have really built um, an incredible partnership with local government in D.C. We have we don't get any um, funding directly from the federal government, and we haven't for many, many years. And um, we really have done a lot of work to build partnerships with a variety of D.C. government agencies. And we've really done that by thinking about what are the aspects of our, aspects of our work that are aligned with the different priorities of the different organizations. And uh, we were talking, we've talked about this a few times today, but um, we really have approached our government funding stream in a similar way as we would approach um, uh, cultivating funders from philanthropy or even individual donors. We really think about what are the priorities of our potential government partners, what are their incentives, and how can we think about our work and talk about our work in a way that's aligned. So we get funding from DC Public Libraries, which has a mission to make sure that its um, patrons have um, access to digital skills. We get funding from the SNAP Employment and Training Program, so we help train recipients of food, the food stamps, basically, um, to get skills so that they can move into the workforce. We, so we really um, have approached it in a, in a cohesive way, and with all of these different funding streams combined, we're able to really have a really strong basis of funding for our programs. Awesome. We get funding from DC Office of the Chief Technology Officer, so a number of different DC government agencies. Everybody's jealous. <laughs> no, no. Okay, Bobby, can we turn to you and tell us just quick about um, your the program that you have at, at Fresno Housing Authority, how you've addressed it? Yeah, so we don't have all those streams of money that are specific to this cause, right? So well, I think what our role and, and when I think of what government's role is, you know, watching the video and everyone thinks that San Francisco is, you know, the hub of technology and there's all these headquarters being built, but then right down the street, this person doesn't have internet. So I'm the IT manager for housing authority, for the housing authority and I think all the infrastructure that had to be built to have the headquarters in downtown San Francisco and passing by CC's house, right? Right directly next to it 
And so I think that our role, we're not educators, you know, we're not really controlling the funding for this specifically, but we are representatives of our 17,000 families that live in our housing or, or you know, around us. And that's pretty strong so that a headquarters doesn't go into our city or into any of your city. And I think this isn't necessarily about just us, but more of a challenge to the group is to not let a company like that go into your city without having the conversation of, you're gonna put all these internet lines in. And so really, Fresno is that, is we're gonna be in front of everyone talking about what you can do for our residents, but for Fresno as a whole in every conversation. So it's not necessarily specific about training or we're not educators, we're not this, but we're gonna make sure that everyone else is thinking about it in some way for our 17,000 families. So Bobby, tell us, um, considering that you do have properties where and buildings where folks don't have access to affordable broadband. What has been your solution? Right, so unfortunately, because we are representing so many families, sometimes that means saying no to programs that come in mm -hmm. and demanding better, yeah. right? So we've had instances where you know someone will come in and want to have a sign up event at some of our properties and they come in with two megs. Like, no, 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 even though it, at the root of it means this family is not gonna have internet, but is two megs really internet? You know, so what we've done is, because we represent a pretty large group of Fresno, that we said no, and you've had to come back and they have, right? Things change because we represent such a large group, right. um, but really not, I'm not a policy expert, I have a high school diploma, <laughs> and I'm surrounded by much smarter people, but that's, you know, what our stance is, is you have to do better for our people you figure out how. Right, what are, and you have multiple solutions, right, to address connectivity. What are your other solutions? Right, so we do have a mesh network at two of our properties where um, it's property-wide Wi-Fi, it's available to all residents without you know, any cost. Um, and one of, the th one of the demonstrations was, here's the individual sign-up events and then here's our property-wide Wi-Fi. What's the take rate, obviously, for the property-wide Wi-Fi? It's 100%. For uh, low cost, we've had about 13% take rate and hours and hours of staff time preparing and monitoring and then that becomes not necessarily a burden but it, it's a, a you know a real stoppage in what you can actually do as far as right. training is concerned because you're really keeping track of do they have internet then I can start training and constantly keeping track and so with our mesh networks you know obviously a hundred percent it also includes the shared areas so when you have partners come in and do training you have internet, you have facilities for them, it's turnkey pretty much. So additional resources come in from partner organizations because you have that connectivity exactly. available in those properties. Yeah. Susan, do you wanna jump in? I, I do actually, how do you turn this on? Oh, hold the bottom button, like two seconds, see a light, come on. Hello? Did it work? Okay, so I know I sound like the, the thundering voice of the federal uh, part of things, but actually, I've been spending a ton of time going to cities and talking to people about, uh, and I, I believe that right now local is the place where all the action is. Uh, I just want to inspire us to think about <laughs> forcing the federal to act at some point. Um, uh, the scrappy cities that are uh, exploring their own ways of providing, let's call it a public option, uh, a plan that for fiber and devices and wireless um, are many in this country. Christopher Mitchell is here, right there in the front row. Come talk to him. He runs uh, MediaNetworks.org and uh, knows everything about this movement and has introduced me to many people. Uh, there are terrific, small, large, medium-sized cities all over America that have taken their destinies into their own hands. And uh, let me just tell one little story about the city of Wilson, North Carolina. Okay, Chris, if I tell the story. Uh, they are providing in public housing uh, fiber to the unit, it's uh, $10 a month. It's a municipal fiber product. They had an electric utility already, so they had a lot of advantages in being able to create that municipal fiber network. But here's something that I find truly moving. Um, in addition to the $10 a month public housing plan, or, which is available to anybody in an apartment building or public housing, if you are short of money or are a credit risk any month, you can just ask for internet access by the day. So, you know, $1.15, $1.20, $1.30, and uh, they'll sell it to you very easy because the whole town has already put in the infrastructure. It's already there. Just flick it on. And if you owe the utility money, and you may, if you're a little short on your paycheck, they will, pr they will put some of the money you do have against paying down that debt. 
And it is so moving and so terrific, and no other internet access provider that I know of lets you pay one day at a time if you're broke. Right. So uh, there are lots of stories like that across the country. That Wilson story is pretty special, but lots of communities are worrying about their own destiny, their own people. We have a little bit of time left. We could do some audience questions. Matthew's on it. Any additional follow-up thoughts from our panelists? <laughs> Other ideas, f or can you share some more, Elizabeth and Lindsay, about, um, I just said two different, <laughs> Bobby, your name is neither of those things. <laughs> those are both my names. He is really attractive, though, so whatever. Um, so other thoughts from you both on how are you solving or you know, getting at these issues with the lack of federal support? Can you talk some more about solutions? Yeah. Sure. yeah. No, go ahead. Maybe the digital literacy training piece of it. Yeah, I mean, so I think for us, we've really approached it. We've really invested in diversifying our funding stream. Okay. Um, and I think uh, I, in 2016, November of 2016, I woke up one morning in November and was grateful that we didn't have um, federal funding. I feel like we, um, I feel gotcha. like our funding, because it comes from local sources, is more secure. And then we really have invested over the past couple of years in um, cultivating more relationships with foundation, so foundation funders, as well as corporate and individual. Um, and you know, it's a cost. It's a cost to have a development director. It's a cost to have a comms director. But it really has paid off for us in that we do now have more flexibility in our funding, which which has allowed us to expand into the state of Maryland for the first time in awesome. our 20 year history and to really be more creative with the work that we do. Bobby, do you want to jump into that? No, yeah, I just want to echo the same things that, okay. you know, the lack of funding causes you to get creative, yeah. right? And I think finding partners that are in the nonprofit world but also the for-profit world helps that uh, creativity, but finding the right partners is the most important, right? Yes. Because not only will you, you know, you are the face of whatever program you're putting on to your residents, and you're gonna have to answer for any partnership, good or bad. Right. And so that's taught us a lot of pretty tough lessons, but the right ones through not having the, just an instant you know, financing source uh, uh, and having to rely on unique partnerships and creative partnerships. Absolutely. Just a, just a second, that the entrepreneurial zeal and partnerships that everybody's cooking up are so exciting. They do remind me slightly of the wrenching story uh, right now on the New York Times site. You can go look at a bunch of pictures of what public school teachers have to buy for their classrooms because there is no public support for supplies. And so although these are great solutions, it is too bad that they have to depend on the grace of particular donors or particular businesses to exist. Absolutely. Questions from the audience? John Windhausen. Hi. Hi. Thanks. Um, so a question for all three of you about uh, having listened to what you just said about the federal government, I'm going to ask you nonetheless about the possibility of federal government spending, funding. Um, as I've been making the rounds on Capitol Hill, there doesn't seem to be uh, a whole lot of momentum behind a broadband infrastructure bill this year, but there is some interest in next year uh, with the possibility of the House flipping to democratic control the House Democrats have put out there the idea of $40 billion uh, for broadband. Uh, we at the Shelby Coalition have said you could probably connect all the anchor institutions for something around $20 billion. So my question to all three of you is, if there is federal momentum to provide some funding to address some of this broadband, do you think that would be welcome? Do you think that would be a good idea? Or are there other things that should be included in a federal broadband infrastructure bill next year that would help to promote this effort in addition to funding. Can, can I add to John's question? Mm -hmm. What should that funding be used for? We can't just say infrastructure, right? That's very vague. Well, I've got a point of view on this one. I, I, I do think that the Broadband Technologies Opportunities Program, the subsidy program, stimulus program in 2010 from the Obama administration is one of the great points of light of the administration and was very well run. Laura's out here, you know, <laughs> thank God for Laura and, and really terrific people that made that happen. It was just a drop in the bucket. And frankly, 40 billion is great, but it, it needs to be much more. If it is 40 billion, it should be only for fiber, should not be funding companies to put in copper mm -hmm. uh, and 
should, and I, I know that anchor institutions are really important, but we've got the problem of the leaner, the kid leaning against the school or against the public library. So I would hope that that would be used in part to spur, um, to guarantee loans uh, from the private sector to support a certain level of standard of fiber going everywhere. That's a great use to which that money could be put. Not so much on direct expenditure, but on guaranteeing loans in, uh, that would be run by local infrastructure banks. Other comments? I think, yeah, I mean, I don't have much to add. I think for Bite Back and for many other um, organizations in this room, that BTOP funding was really transformative. I mean, we were a small community-based organization and it really enabled us to grow and expand our impact. And then we've been able to build on it from them. So of course, I'm biased towards training. I think that you know, we can, if folks have access to internet, it's extremely vital. But if they don't know how to use it, um, there's only so much it can do. Thank you. Other questions in the audience? Oh, all the way over here. He's coming to you. Uh, thank you. The question is for the gentleman. Who built those mesh networks and who maintains them and is responsible for them? Yeah, that's a great question because a lot of it is an odd idea that comes up in the middle of the night and we should do it, but who's going to maintain <laughs> and run them is the hard part. Um, so for the first year, we, that was part of the installation of a, a third party uh, contractor installed them and they maintained them for the first year and that included tech support. But from there forward, our own internal IT manages and supports it. Thank you. Other questions? Sorry, this is a question for Professor Crawford. Um, I appreciate your presentation. I, I didn't hear a lot about sort of legal causes of action and wondered whether that was because there aren't any or whether you're just kind of keeping that on the down low. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, this is not about litigation. This is about bravery. This is about courage. This is about leadership. And there's no substitute for that. There, these, the deep pockets that I mentioned, those five companies, they will happily litigate with you until the end of time, <laughs> until the sun explodes. But there will be no grand result from that. Uh, the, really, the only thing that's going to work is treating this like public infrastructure, like Electricity or, or uh, you know, sewage. Uh, I know we feel we're more romantic than sewage, but in fact, <laughs> it's, a, it's a public work. And so uh, locally, it starts with local leadership, then mayors get jealous of each other, and then the country gradually wakes up. And I think we are in this process gradually. I would like it to get sped up, and I would like it to be much more of an election issue than it is at the moment. Hi, I appreciated your comments about fiber being the, <clears throat> the standard that we should build out. But you know, there's a lot of pushback that I hear from legislators that, that continue to believe that technology is the answer, <clears throat> even though a lot of our constituents don't have 2G, uh, let alone 5G. Um, but how do, you, how, how do you interact? That I mean, now we've got we've got Microsoft talking about TV white space. When we've got Elon Musk with the, the low terrestrial satellites and. And, and some of these, at, at the federal level, it, John, you probably run against them, and, and even at the state level, saying we don't need to worry about this because Elon's going to fix it all. <laughs> right. Well, so far, that consumer-priced um, Tesla 3 car has not come out. I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> so, you know, uh, that's a little cheap. I, I do think that, um, look, uh, as far as we can tell, there's nothing with higher capacity than fiber at speed of light, you know, unlimited, as far as we know. And it, it's going to be necessary for the tsunami of data from all the wireless devices that people are planning. I don't know how we're going to handle backhaul. I mean, it's fiber as deep as we can get it. Maybe it doesn't have to touch your house, but it has to come pretty close. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think there's any substitute for that. And satellite, even if it's low latency, it's pretty far up there for that sat. It's 22,000 miles. So um, when you actually need to be in the operating room for that little girl, you're not going to want to rely on a satellite. Sorry, did I cut you off? You looked like you were no, about to. No, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, so we've said a lot today about the federal government and then also local initiatives, but I was wondering if the panelists could speak to state level efforts. 
Yeah. Well, I would say DC, the District of Columbia is <laughs> kind of like a state. Um, <laughs> um, but we don't have any representation in Congress. Um, <laughs> So we, we also get funding from the state of Maryland. As I said, we just expanded into the state of Maryland. Um, you know, I think uh, in, in coming to this conference for the past few years and meeting a lot of folks in this community, I think that one of the things we struggle with, and I, was, I just went to a wonderful panel with some foundation leaders, is that there isn't a lot of funding specifically for broadband or specifically for digital literacy. A lot of the funding that's out there is around other issues like workforce development or housing um, or education. And so I think you know there's funding available from all at all different levels, but a lot of how we access it is around telling our story in a way and doing work that really aligns with those other types of priorities. I mean, I think it really speaks to Susan's amazingly powerful and eloquent speech that most people don't understand that this is such an incredible, incredibly significant issue and one that is truly driving inequality. People aren't thinking about it that way. They're thinking about, well, okay, we'll support it because it's a pathway to get a job, for example. Right. Right. And I think, I mean, California is different for all kinds of ways, right? <laughs> <laughs> but one, there, there has been some uh, significant investment in digital literacy training. Um, but I think one thing that we can do better, thinking about state leadership, is being more in tune with this community about writing that policy mm -hmm. and what actually works and what, where the direction of technology is going, but also the models that have worked and framing the new policy around that versus just kind of taking a stab at it of what they think is or maybe what uh, internet service providers think is gonna be the next wave and starting with the grassroots and talking about where it should be and what they should be talking about and writing it flexible enough so that we can be creative with it. In, in California, it really is the only state with a significant digital literacy funding. None, the other states have these small amounts that are only for libraries, which is limiting, right? Because then the Fresno Housing Authority folks then bite back, wouldn't have access to those funds, don't have access to those funds. Uh, the other thing for states in, the, in terms of state laws and bills, uh, the re, one of the, uh, an underlying reason that the, the digital redlining occurs here in Cleveland and in other areas of Ohio and other states is because of a state franchise, state franchise law that we have here. And it says that the uh, cable providers specifically can, they can just, you know, have a whole state franchise. But then nobody actually goes back to check to make sure that they roll it out everywhere. Um, so, so that's a, at the time, 10 years ago, it passed easily. Folks were like, yeah, this is a good idea. It was a bipartisan yes. And it was only a couple folks on the ground, like Bill Callahan, who were like, this is not going to turn out well for poor folks. <laughs> In fact, for, in my experience, that's mostly been the role of states. And even California, it was just Governor Brown who got in the way of a juggernaut removing local control over cell sites. Mm -hmm. A bill was plowing through on its way to be passed. We've had a ton of those bills. And the idea of local control has also been suppressed by 19 or 20 states that have said it made it either impossible or very difficult to have a city be involved in municipal fiber. So. Uh, in my experience, states are pretty easily captured, and the big guys are very good at having man-on-man -man lobbying. Um, and so you would need to really watch out for things that happen at the state level when no one's paying attention. Other questions? Hi, thanks. Hi, Susan. I'm Tom Esselman with Connecting for Good in Hello. Kansas City. Um, thinking about the short term, what actions that we could actually take that could actually help Chrissy, I think her name is, the young lady, within a two-year period. I know two things that we do, wireless mesh networks and mobile Wi-Fi hotspots, they're adequate to form a bridge, um, but they're hard to do without support. Yeah. And right now, the Lifeline Broadband Provider designation ought to be able to be something in the context of what we just saw to reasonably and rationally support organizations like us that build these things to provide that bridge. In this context, I'm just curious your opinion, is it a possibility that 
the current set of commissioners could break through outside of the two who believe that it can. And, is and there, now we're down to one. Is there, is it, well, I just wanted to know your opinion on the lifeline issue. Since it was introduced under the Reagan administration, for God's yeah. sake. Look, it's a central tenet of universality of telecommunications that everybody gets a respectable line no matter what their income level. And that's what's behind Lifeline, that's what drives it, and that is not a belief of the current FCC chairman. Mm. It's not what he's fighting for. I mean, it's just not. He's not saying that everybody is entitled to this. If he was, he'd have a whole different set of policies behind Lifeline. I think it's being gutted. I think anything that might help poor people is being gutted right now. So to, in answer to your question, what can we do in the what short do? term? I think raising a ruckus would be a good idea, <laughs> frankly. And I'm not much for ruckuses. <laughs> Yeah. No, I've only been, you know, it really is Mariah's video and just all these talks I've had in cities. I'm a Quaker violist. I'm not supposed to be <laughs> making noise about anything, but it just, it, but this strikes me so deeply unfair and so corrosive. And I get to talk to people, so it seems important that I talk about it, but I don't know what happens other, short of a real ruckus about these issues and making it a, an election issue. Other questions? Andrew, our awesome intern. <laughs> all right, hello. Uh, for all you that don't know, I'm actually still a student. Um, so, so talking about the, so listening, I, I, while I'm listening to you guys speak, I'm also kind of thinking of what students can also do on, on a, on a, on like a down low, you know. Yeah. Kid, kid level, not not national level like you guys are talking about. So, I just kind of, I'm thinking of like a lot of ideas, but I want I want I want like your opinions on what I could do on a local level because I come from a I come from a community where my we have a, I come from a smaller school. We have 4,000 students, but I can assure you that 39 at least 3,900 out of those 4,000 students work, mm -hmm. and they work they work not only to pay their tuition but to pay all their bills because most of the people. I come from rural Kansas, so most people most people come from farm backgrounds. You know, farm backgrounds don't they don't really make a lot of money anymore. Or um, we come there are a lot of Im uh, immigrants, both legal and illegal. Like I came from an immigrant family myself, and those those um, families uh, can't really can barely afford uh, to take their to send their kids to school. But when you add internet. Internet access on top of that, people people in my community are paying like 50, 50 to one hundred dollars just for just for internet access. So, so I'm wondering how people like students, like me, can like come come into the conversation. Well, I'll start with that one because I think students are actually the natural place mm -hmm. for a lot of the conversation because you can organize a university. Any school is a great platform for bringing in community people. Uh, local government, whoever you can get to come talk about this issue, have sort of teach, help people understand it, gather the facts in your local area, uh, create a coalition that, and get to know your local CIO. Maybe he wants to help, or she. Let's hope maybe there might be one she out there. <laughs> and, uh, and, and organize. This is a moment for organizing and creating local leadership that can uh, understand what no one's talking about be very level-headed and go and grapple with the mayor and everybody else and see what you can do to make the situation better. I think you're in the best possible place for us. Well, that's just the piggyback. So, oh. so j I think there's a problem with Susan's mic. Is that correct? Oh. Yeah. Did you accidentally? Can I turn it off? You muted it, maybe. I'm sure you heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Organize, organize and use, think of every, I mean, what, for God's sake, is the business model of a university these days? They have nice buildings, so you might as well open up those buildings to have meetings of everybody interested in this issue and get some, there'll be great volunteers from across almost any, any community that want to help but don't have a place to go. And so you become the gathering place for that. It becomes this very, just like a drumbeat of regular meetings and helping each other understand it, what's possible in your locality. Just, just get going and keep going and keep doing it all the time. That's what I would advise. Yeah, and I think the reality is that your generation and generations after yours are much better at harnessing the internet's power. I mean, yeah. We've seen it March for Lives and all these things. You're way better at using your internet privilege, let's say, to reach bigger audiences and you know, emotion, you know, strike out emotion and all these things that you 
use that and your voice through the internet and through your connection through social media to, to cause a stir and to cause a ruckus, to keep right. adding to that, <laughs> right? Because you're much better at that than we are. But then vote, that's, right. the, that's the other next step. Yeah. There is an election coming up. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Very important. Right. Other questions, last questions. Bruce, way in the back. Way in the back. Uh, just a quick one. What's the, uh, how do you plan to distribute that film? Because I heard a quote earlier today that stories move people and data move institutions. And I thought that was really mm. quick. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the story that you just told is really powerful. So, what's the distribution mechanism? Where are people going to be able to share that so we can continue to build this, uh, make this progress? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question, thank you. Um, so, there, if you go to dividinglines.org, there are already three videos. There are two about rural infrastructure divides and focused on Tennessee, and those are free for you to distribute as you can use them. I really want them to be useful. And then there's a trailer leading up to this video, which has not been screened before, and I'm holding off on posting it publicly online until we get a few more private screenings and kind of build up the hype around it. Um, but please reach out to me individually if you have screenings in mind, if you have hearings, committee meetings, conversations with funders, if this can be useful to your work. So really what we need, we need to do? Email you thing on the site. Yes, there's a contact form for me on the site. Yeah. So we, we need to get lots of folks to do private screenings. Right. Yes. So then we can have it more publicly available. So then we're going to make it publicly available. Which is very exciting. And it is being live, like we live streamed this yeah, whole thing. Yes, so you thing. can watch. So it is yeah. being watched now outside, yeah. which is awesome. That's yeah. great. Thank you. That was a good question. Thank you. Yes, we could. We can also certainly. Yeah. We 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 will make that happen. The question was, could we post Professor Professor Crawford's speech? And Absolutely. I think we can include the ruckus. We will, yeah. def we will definitely include some ruckus. I think that should be the theme now, is right. <laughs> I have a quick question, Angela. Last question, James has okay. the last question. Uh, this question is for the whole panel. I'm very interested in uh, the development of rural broadband. What are the ways in which rural entities, rural citizens, uh, rural libraries, how can they advocate for themselves um, knowing that there is not much economic incentive for development and of in broadband infrastructure? Actually, that's a set. Chris, when is your session? That's the last session. The last session tomorrow, that exact item will be addressed. Uh, Chris and Deb are doing an awesome session about um, local solutions with uh, considering uh, infrastructure and affordable solutions within those infrastructure solutions. What we are seeing in rural areas is real organizing. It is super fascinating because neighbors are getting together, you know, uh, total bipartisan kind of, they don't care. And they're saying, we have a problem. And they are figuring out solutions. And Chris and Deb have those answers for you. OK, there's some snacks outside <laughs> and some beverages. Some and Susan, you'll stick around for a bit? Sure. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much.